keep it to 10. I might be keeping it to 20 this morning. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I want to tell you a story. I've been doing a lot of, you know, as you would imagine, wrapping up, summing up, thinking of things, and I got lots and lots of memories. And in fact, last night, you get Rosa added to one of my memories. Um, she brought in a picture of me baptizing one of her grandchildren uh, 25 years ago, you know. And I, 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 I wish I, I had brought it in this morning to show you. I have a picture in my office somewhere of myself with the wardens, Reg Reese and Barbara Hyron, uh, at my induction in uh, September of 89, and then this picture in 91. And when I looked at that picture last night, I could not believe the difference in the way I looked. When I was inducted, I had dark hair, it was significantly longer than later, but dark hair, and you couldn't see the top of my head. Uh, by 91, you could, and I was significantly more gray. And looking at that, I was thinking, I was thinking, did you do that to me? You know, <laughs> what, what did that to me? That you know? was before me, just FYI. Oh, yeah, yeah, way, way, I didn't even know her. Oh, well, yeah, um, let's not go there. Um, and I, I'm looking at those, those pictures, and, and in one sense, it really contextualized some of the things that I've been thinking over the past couple of months. Because it is fair to say, it is true to say, uh, it has been the best of times and it has been the worst of times. Uh, some of the things that ministers go through, not just me, but ministers go through, um, you just simply would not imagine. You would simply not imagine. Uh, sometimes people feel away emotionally and they don't know how to articulate what it is that's going on inside them. They may feel angry or depressed or frustrated or thwart, whatever they feel, and usually on the negative side, and they don't know how to take ownership of the emotion uh, and, and to understand it. So you know what they do? They make up stories and they trash people and they lie and they attempt to destroy because there's this foul part of humanity that, not all the time, but if you feel miserable, uh, somehow by seeing that there's some other people that are more miserable, it makes you feel better. And uh, if they're not miserable enough, then you make them miserable. Uh, and, and I've had some of those experiences at St. Mary's. You know, one of the funniest that ever happened. It became funny in retrospect, but it wasn't funny at all at the time. Um, a mother came to me one day after church and said she wanted her son ba uh, confirmed. Uh, I had never met her son, you know. And um, so I said that. I, I, I never, never met him. Like, has he been around? Like, because I was relatively new. This was during the first couple of years. And uh, she said, no, uh, he has hockey on Sundays. Okay. So he had never been to Sunday school, certainly not part of our youth program, not part of anything, but he was 13 years old, and so it was time to get him confirmed. Wow. And so I said to the mother, and I said it nicely, I said, well, it would be hard to present him to the bishop to be confirmed because there's really nothing to be confirmed. Um, he would have to be a part of, you know, the youth program in one way or another. Um, and, and we'd have to talk. Like, I'd, ha I'd have to know the guy. Anyway, so the story that started going around was that I wasn't going to confirm the kid because he, he wouldn't come to my youth group, which was just a little bit twisted. I actually got a call from downtown about the, from, that, from the bishop's office. Um, because she had called with a complaint to the bishop. And the bishop wanted, to know, wanted me to know that he had heard the story and completely agreed and expected when confirmation came that he would not be confirmed and if he was there, he would be absolutely disappointed in me. Thank God for Reg Hollis. Anyway, um, I had another conversation later on with the mother. And you could really tell that she was trying to grease the wheels here and get things going and she said, well, his grandfather was a minister. 
He still, even after the initial conversation, hadn't come to church even once, you know? And so what happened then was she called up another priest, the priest who was then at St. Matthias in Hampstead, St. Matthews in Hampstead, who she knew from high school years, and uh, said to Peter that um, the minister at St. Mary's, evil person, uh, refused to baptize uh, uh, refused to confirm her son, would he do it? And Peter knows me very well. Lovely, lovely man. He and his wife Doreen, just marvelous people. And he said, that doesn't sound like Lorne to me. You know? And so he did a little exploration and agreed to meet with this young man to talk about faith and talk about confirmation. Refused to meet. You know? but still wanted confirmation. So you know what they ended up doing? They ended up getting him confirmed at the United Church in Lachine. And of course, Lorne is evil. You know, another story, and this one's even funnier. Uh, Lori, kitty corner treasurer person. One day she was talking to uh, one of her friends slash neighbors about the minister at St. Mary's and how magnificent he was. You know, he is so good with kids. They got this amazing music thing going. He's got, like, you know what? Jesus, move over. I'm taking the right hand, okay? It was just, it was, it was, mm. but the person before him was horrible. Nobody liked him. He was awful. He was terrible. da 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 and of course, the punchline of the story is they were talking about me as well because they were only talking about the mean minister who'd been here a couple of years previously. And at that point, I'd been here about 15 years, you know. So, you know, on the one hand, and I could give you, I could give you over 100 more stories like this. There's some spiritual ones too. Uh, in my last parish, and this is one of the ones that made me the saddest of all the stories that I have to tell in ministry. One Sunday in Mascouche, uh, it was about coming to Jesus. The, the, the reading was about coming to Jesus. And so I did a sermon about coming to Jesus. And I said to the congregation, I said, you know, this Sunday when you come up to communion, if you feel a need to get closer to Jesus, bring up your prayer book with you, just as a sign, you know, that this is something that you want to do. And just as I give you your communion, I'll say a prayer with you that you and Jesus will become closer. Well, I expected four or five people to respond. Uh, I did not know it was gonna be over 40. And that added time to the service. The service went long. And um, <laughs> I arrived late for my service in Montreal North. I nearly got a speeding ticket again. Um, anyway, I heard through the grapevine that one of my parishioners was really, really upset, you know, at what I had done. And so I decided to go over and talk to him, you know, because I had a reasonable relationship with him, so I thought. And, and, and we sat down, and he offered me coffee. And uh, I said to him, I said, Frank, I, I hear you're upset by what happened on, on Sunday. And he said, oh, yeah. He says, all this Pentecostal, uh, he says, I'm not into that. And uh, I said, well, look, all it was was, you know, God wants us to know his love. And all I was doing was saying to people, if you feel you'd like to get closer to God, just come, and I'll say a prayer with you. There's nothing more Anglican than saying a prayer with somebody. Come on. And anyway, he says, no, that is not the way we do things in this church. If this is the way it's going to be, I am not coming back to St. Margaret's. And I said, Frank, I can really understand that this isn't your thing. And there's, there's, there's no way that I would try to imply that you, you know, I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but can't you at least celebrate for the people who found something? And you know what he said? No. No. And at that point, I knew the game was lost. The game was lost. Uh, if a person, when you say, can't you celebrate for people who are finding something spiritually that is important to them, is helpful to them, and your answer is, nope. Can't celebrate that. You have no business being in a church. Don't know what you were doing there in the first place. And then, same church, 
lovely man, Kenny was his name, lovely man, lay reader. After the predis, my predecessor had left, he uh, did services on Sunday. Uh, apparently his preaching was really, really good. Um, but when I came to St. Margaret's, he, 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 he said to me, in a very nice way, like no confrontation, no anger, no nothing. He said um, that he was going to be stepping back as a lay reader now that I was there. And I was oh, that's too bad because people, you know, they say how, how great you, you lead the service and your sermons are really great. And he says, Lauren, the reason I became a lay reader was because I was advancing in the company and I was having to do a lot of presentations and I was terrible at public speaking. But becoming a lay reader gave me practice at public speaking. And then he told me he bought his sermons. You know, you can mail order sermons. Now you do it online. But he used to buy his sermons. That's why they were so good. And we had a short talk about faith. And there was absolutely none there. And it struck me how here's a person leading worship of Almighty God and preaching. And none of it was touching him. And that made me terribly, terribly sad. So a few stories. So why am I saying these stories this, 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 this morning? I'm doing a lot of summing up. And um, when I left my last parish, the reading for the day was about the, uh, the, the Ascension. And um, there's, there's different versions of the thing. But the disciples are there. Jesus says, come, come with me. And... Uh, the transfiguration, I said ascension, I meant transfiguration, sorry. And uh, Jesus starts glowing with a, with a radiant light. And uh, Moses and Elijah appear. And the disciples are not like, wow. They're having this apparition. And they do. Jesus, what, what do you want us to do? You know, and the story goes on. And then at a certain point, uh, the reading says that the other two had disappeared and all that there was was Jesus. And what I said to the congregation then was, uh, you know, I pray that after Lorne leaves and we had just built a building and we'd grown a lot and we'd hired more staff and we'd, we'd been a success in some of the right ways. You can be a success in the wrong ways too, but uh, and I hope that that's what, what's left of the Lorne regime is that people remember something about Jesus in a way that they didn't before. And my stepping down here is somewhat different. You know, that wouldn't be the right sermon to do here. I think the right thing to do here would be more like the gospel reading for today. Um, the gospel reading for today was written as a reminder to the community. Um, it's written as a story. You know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Him was light, and that light was the life of man. And to all who believed, uh, who, who received, who believed in His name, He gave power to become the children of God. Children born not of a father's will or of the flesh, but children born of God. That's an ongoing story. That was the ongoing story, the ongoing revelation to the church. And I, I, I think that's a pretty good one. Um, for my last official thing because the reality is uh, e even though my position is going to be different uh, I'm still going to remain part of the story I'm still going to remain part of your story and you're still going to remain, remain part of my story you know and, and, and when they wrote that down in the Gospel of John they wrote it down at the very beginning of the next step of a journey you know, there was a lot of stuff they knew. There was a lot of stuff they had a clue what was what was going to come next. And in some sense, I feel that way. I, I don't I don't really have much of an idea of what's going to happen to me in life and in ministry in the next little while. But I know that whatever it is, the light will be there with me. You know, and I will continually have the choice of stepping into the light or stepping out of the light, just like they did. And and I know that no matter what happens for St. Mary's, St. Mary's is going to have that choice too, uh, to step into the light or step out of the light, um, to panic, you know, over leaky roofs and budgets and all the rest of it, 
or to really ask the question, what does God want of us now? What does God want of us now? I, I, I don't think I've used all the 20 minutes that I wanted to use this morning. I, I, I want to tell you another story. You know, one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm not overly worried about, but it's just on my mind. I don't want my brain to rot once I'm no longer, you know, in the, in the saddle. And so one of the things I did this fall, I took a course from Wesleyan University in, in the States, online course. And uh, I bet you expected that last night I was going to say what my mark was. <laughs> I'm not going to. Um, and it's been fascinating. It, 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 the course is about how to change the world. I've been looking at issues like climate change, poverty, women, uh, issues of women. And I found, it, I, I found it amazing because most of the people taking the course are nice Western North Americans just like me. And, and for us, a lot of the stuff that we're looking at is in many ways theoretical, like how women are treated in the third world. But one of the people who's taking the course, he's uh, in, in Indonesia and he's an ITP, internally displaced person, like, like a refugee, but ITP. And so he's in a camp, you know. And I'm there, you know, writing six essays from a pretty theoretical and certainly safe place in the world. He's actually where all this stuff is happening. Like when it's talking about how women are treated and girls are treated. And there's lots of kids here today, so I'm not going to say, but use your imagination. Let it run as wild as you can, and it'll still be short of the reality. For him... All that stuff is happening next door to where he's living, you know. Uh, one of his essays, when we were talking about pollution, he spoke of how a factory in the area dumps all its liquid waste, chemical waste, into the, the river that they use, you know, for their drinking water and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And how the town got together to protest this and to draw attention to the fact that this factory was dumping all its effluent in, into their river uh, that was the, their, their life source. And um, it became a big thing that they were protesting this. And so the government came in and just leveled their town, just, just destroyed all the dwellings in their, in their town to stop them, you know? And I'm thinking, man, you know, this is the reality that this guy is living in. Man, this is the world we're living in. It's, it's, it's real, you know. So, yeah, leaky roof and tough budget. God is, God is calling us, you know, to be active and to be world transformers. Whether you're in a wheelchair and running a church or whether, whether or not. Whether or not. And so the gospel reading. In the beginning was the word. God communicating his will to us. And the word became flesh, dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We beheld his glory. You know, glory as has been revealed to us. And then that part that I love so much. To all who received, who believed on his name. He gave power to become the children of God. We all have the power to be the children of God. And what's that power for? That power is to transform. Transform our lives, the lives of those whom we love, and transform the world. And so whatever happens to me, whatever happens to St. Mary's, my hope and daily prayer, really, is that more and more we behave like the children of God we're called to be. And that we will be transformers of the world. And I, 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 have a, I have a dream, maybe it's not a dream, maybe it's a fantasy. When we look at St. Mary's Sunday by Sunday, you know, and we grieve the attendance, you know, and grieve the times we're living in from a churchianity point of view, I dream that the message and the ministry of this church will be heard and seen in such powerful ways that people who are lost and searching will say, I want to be a part of that. Uh, 
I want to be a part of changing the world. Uh, I want to be a part of that community of people who have dedicated themselves to making this a better place to live. You know, the final thing I want to say this morning is, I wondered how I'd conclude this morning. Um, but there really can't be a conclusion, can there? For, for, for any of us. Because at the end of the service, you know, I'm going to sort of wheel myself to the back and we'll do our dismissal. And then we're going to eat something St. Mary's is really good at. And I'm going to get in my adapted transport thing and we're all going to go home to our turkeys. And I'm not talking about the husband or wife. I'm talking about the bird that we're going to eat. Um, and um, we're going to carry on with our lives. <coughs> but I hope that a large part of what we understand as we carry on with our daily lives is that our lives are a gift to us from God and our lives are also to be a gift to the world around us from God. A gift that transforms. I started off with some bad stories. As time goes by, there'll be an opportunity to tell more stories. This I know. God does great and glorious things. He has done them and he will continue to do them in this place, in and through.